Welcome to Dear Romance Writer, your home for the questionable advice for the bewildered and befuddled, random pop culture recommendations, and conversations about you feelings. Be sure to send in your letters seeking advice on our anonymous form at dearromancewriter.com. Dear Romance Writer is part of the Frolic Podcast Network, a podcast community of everything romance and romance related. If you're into romance fiction of any flavor, the Frolic Podcast Network includes shows that feature book club style discussions, author interviews, comedy, critique, and fantastic conversations as well. Includes some of the most innovative, interesting, and entertaining podcasts, including Kinda Dating, Crappy Friends, My Imaginary Friends, Smart Podcast Trashy Books, and Jeff and Will's Big Gay Fiction Podcast. What does this mean for you, the listener? More shows to enjoy and more opportunities for us to introduce you to great episodes and new podcasts you'll love. Find new shows to add to your podcast subscriptions at frolic.media slash podcasts. Now on to this week's show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Dear Romance Writer. Uh, today, we have an amazing guest for you, Katie Robert, who is joining us here to talk about sex relationships and, you know, whatever happens. Uh, Katie, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, where everyone can find you, and what your current work in progress is? Yes, um, I write dark-ish, ish, dark light or erotic romance. Um, a lot of mom. Neon gods, it's so good. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I I'm keep checking so my inbox for the yeah. second one. I'm like, where's my arc? Listen, yeah. I, I have. We thought we were them. friends. Hey, I, they haven't sent me the link to like the auto approve mm-hmm. stuff yet. They're I, I uh-huh. they're all on my uh-huh. list. <laughs> um but yeah i write like a lot of retellings and just like high high heat high shenanigans high level bonkers um yeah i'm working actually on the third dark olympus book right now i'm doing edits it's helen achilles and patroclus um i'm still a little shocked that they let me have a menage in my main traditional series but you know what they did they were doing it uh so i'm mostly on twitter instagram and tiktok i'm bad at dms you're, like, you're tiktok famous yes. mildly I'm, I'm not not by any any effort on my own like i'm doing okay but like tiktok is doing the tiktok thing like that it's like a wild beast it's just there's no control in it it just does what it wants <laughs> um but yeah so that's just that's me i, I do it full time i really like the bonkers stories so if you pick up a katie roberts book it's going to be it's, it might scandalize you mildly, hopefully. hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a good old hot time. Yeah. 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 It's yeah, enjoyable. My- You'll have fun. I get a lot of like, I didn't know I was into this kink until I read this book. And now I think I might be into this kink, at least. Frequently. And I was like, you're welcome. You're broadening minds. <laughs> you're, you're broadening minds. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> well, welcome. We're happy to have you. Thank um, you so much for having maybe you me. can help us with this, this letter. We pulled this letter from, I keep hitting the thing and like it tells me it wants me to edit i'm like i don't want to edit i just want to read it um but this letter is interesting so we didn't have a reader letter or listener letter this week so, so we this pulled... is your reminder to send some in yes right to they're us. anonymous people we're so gentle and kind we won't like do anything but um we'll make so... your first time feel really good <laughs> <laughs> yes um, yes. So this is actually a Dear Prudence letter. So we're going old school okay. this week. This is a Dear Prudence letter and it's from 2013. And I say that because I'm going to read the letter and then we can chat about it. But I want to actually talk about the response to the letter because I think if the response was, if this letter was received today, even like eight years later, it would have been really different. At least I hope it would have been really different. But let me read the letter. Um So it says, I have been seeing a really sweet guy for three months. He is intelligent, fun, considerate, and generous. My issue is that he's a virgin and doesn't seem very interested in changing that. We are both in our early 30s. I'm recently divorced. My husband was a compulsive cheat, and I have a two-year-old son. I've discussed sex with, quote-unquote, James, and he said he originally wanted to wait until marriage for religious reasons, but now doesn't feel that is necessary. He just wants to be with the right person. We were making out the other night and I whispered to him how much I wanted him. He said he wanted me too, but he sounded awkward and unconvincing. 
He always tells me that he, we can't do anything because he doesn't have condoms, but he hasn't made any attempts to purchase some. I can tell he's aroused when we kiss, but I'm worried that he just isn't very interested in sex. That would be tough for me to handle long term. Is it wrong that I expect our relationship to be further along after three months? My friends say I need a man with more heat and passion, but I am hesitant to pass up an otherwise great guy. Oh, interesting. There are so many places to go with this. Yeah. It's really funny. Like, yeah. it it sounds almost like, like, if it sounds like he's just not that into sex. Like, doesn't, if he, if he wanted to have it, he would have it at this point. Like, if, if religious reasons are not part of the equation, like, which it sounds like they aren't as much as he sounds yeah well, he's I, got three excuses in there right one was religion two was the right person which okay if they've been there together like anyway and then three was condoms so he's like he's just throwing excuse after excuse after excuse so yeah either he's not ready it sounds like either he hasn't come to terms with his asexuality or she really isn't the person that he wants to be with yeah. physically for some reason or whatever there's like a lot going there, on there's well, a it, lot going on he's um, definitely it, not being honest with like his feelings yeah. or maybe he can't face his feelings i mean that's a thing that, like yeah but she's also she's got baggage yeah and she's also like i feel like sex is very similar to kids and that it's like you if you don't line up you can't force it like you can mm -hmm. communicate and like make sure you, but like if you like really don't line up like one person wants it one person obviously doesn't like that's not something that like somebody's gonna be unhappy and not get their needs met mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah um hey you guys i realized we didn't introduce ourselves even after <laughs> <laughs> because we are a group of dumbasses hi i'm dumbass uh avery flynn <laughs> go ahead you guys <laughs> I'm Zio Axelrod. I guess I'm a dumbass as well. <laughs> uh, I am dumbass or I'm Parish. <laughs> so there you go. And what's funny, you guys laugh, but we actually remind ourselves before every episode to do this. And I think we forget 75% of the time. Because we so, can see each other and, yeah, and, and, yeah. and our names are there, but like, you know, 90% of our people are listening, yeah. not seeing these. So, <laughs> so uh, that aside, now that you've got... Uh, names to go with voices. I think there are several things that come up in this. I think the fact that this letter came out in 2013, I think there was not the communication at that point in time that there is now, um, mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. least not in the vanilla straight community right. about mm -hmm. different types of sexuality, you know, demisexual, asexual, different mm -hmm. levels of asexuality, wherever this person may be. Yeah, yeah. So I think there could be a lack of knowledge part on, yeah, on yeah. being able to have the language to explain these feelings number yeah. one uh number two the fact that they use wanting to he used wanting to wait for marriage also tells me that that may in addition what kind of sexual sex education right. has this person had mm -hmm. um so there's that mm -hmm. um i said earlier that the that the um the woman writing the letter had some baggage and what i meant by that is that if she and this is something I will harp on a lot, but, you know, a lot of times people who are raised in the United States as women, socialized as women, your desirability is your value. So if she has already been, seen her desirability rejected by the ex-husband who cheated on her, mm -hmm. and then she's got a fiance or boyfriend I'm not, I, boyfriend I'm, I think well boyfriend. they only been okay. three months I, yeah I three months oh my god please don't be a fiance <laughs> yet sorry that's really judgy but I'm just gonna be that person anyways so if you know they've been together three months and he is already whether she can verbalize the fact that she's feeling rejected or not I'm sure that factors into it so that makes it become bigger and bigger but yeah I think Katie is completely right Sex is one of those things where if you are not able to have your needs met and be upfront about that and align up, that doesn't mean you have to match exactly, but you have to be able to give your partner the space to be able to have their sexual needs met. But what I well, get from this is that he is probably on some spectrum of asexuality and, um, 
And she is having big time rejection, desirability issues. I would also be really curious on if she, because there's a lot of like insinuation of like, shouldn't we be this? Shouldn't, and I sort of whispered in his ear, like, are you being very clear and explicit on like, this is important to me. This mm-hmm. is something like, like, cause if you're just, I think that's also something in us raised female that you like, he should just know he should just want me all the time he should just be ready to go like all the time and that's not necessarily how it works in real life and like if you cannot explicitly be like this is a need of mine like like they just need to have an explicit conversation and even if he can't put the like verbiage on like I am this this Mm -hmm. he should still be able to explain his needs and she should be able to explain her needs and they can see if they like match up and it doesn't sound like they do (laughs) Yeah. Bro, and she's singing your song. <laughs> <laughs> it's one that I, I feel like while you're having sex is kind of, or while you're trying to initiate sex is like about the worst time to try to oh, have. Oh God, yeah. Yeah. Where, uh, both parties feel able to discuss their feelings, conversation about like what you desire. And so absolutely, I think they need to have an explicit conversation sometime that is a not sexualized moment. Mm-hmm. Um, that also, emotions when you're in the high. car <laughs> driving someplace that is like my favorite place to have uncomfortable conversations because you're trapped <laughs> you're trapped <laughs> and you're trapped and you can't look at each other and you just or at least the passenger doesn't have to but the driver hopefully please god so just not a conversation that's make, gonna make you cry because that could be dangerous but otherwise it's like my perfect place to have sex talks with the kids so yeah <laughs> awkward conversations the car my kids just do it around the dinner table. They just like launch stuff at me that I'm like, <laughs> oh, sure. I will explain how fisting works. Okay. That was the most recent question that I'm like, I'm very happy that you feel comfortable enough to ask me this. <laughs> like none of them are active, but they have questions. And I'm like, I'm just going to turn into the color of a plum and I'm going to answer this as technically as possible. Like, but yeah, I, I, the car would be so much better. <laughs> like, <laughs> Just take random drives. Mm. Anyway, sorry, Ron. I did that. Oh no, no, I like it. He, she could like terrify him by being like, "So I want to talk about fisting," and then (laughs) dial it back. I just want to have a little conversation about that. You know. Um, Well, and I also, sorry to like say worst possible segue ever, but I also wonder if he's had like some sexual trauma as well. Um, Mm -hmm. He feels because he. He, if she can feel him becoming physically aroused, that's one thing, but like physical arousal is not consent. Physical arousal does not imply emotional mm-hmm. or right. um, mental right. fire for sex. Right. Yeah, so yeah. I think that like, it would be a mistake for her to conflate those two. And uh, that just makes it like maybe a slightly more complicated conversation, but yeah. definitely something that like she needs to talk about, especially because three months into a relationship is still like, I mean, I'm sure that's that still new. Lot, but that's still like if you have a major incompatibility like katie said yeah that's still like well within the get the fuck out period. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, i mean he they, don't try to make a huge a relationship work for years and years and years if you're going into it already with this major incompatibility yeah and he's if they're they've been together for three months he's 30 30 years old and he's never had sex as far as she knows so they're definitely they're you know all the excuses he's throwing at her could be him covering up for some past trauma or for some past insecurity or some current insecurity that he has you know maybe he he just could never you know you go through life um especially in, in America it's like all the movies tell you you're supposed to have sex when you're like 16 17 18 years old in high school or whatever and that doesn't happen and you get to college and it doesn't happen there and then you just keep going you know and it never happens and it's not because you don't want to it's because it just you never had the opportunity so here he is in this relationship he could just be freaking out yeah you that's know? a good point of like uh, like she has a kid she's obviously yeah. you know has experience and i don't have experience and if we do this then but if it's awful for her and then she dumps me and she dumps me yeah that, yeah and that then the be... dude's supposed to know what he's doing yeah so yeah. I just wrote this book which is really funny um that like my most recent book is about a guy who um, he's like demisexual, but he definitely is interested in sex. But he, when he was like 17 or 18, he had a, an experience, but then his parents died and he was suddenly like running the family business, raising oh. his little brother. Yeah. And he was, had so much responsibility that he just like, wasn't thinking about sex at all. Then all of his friends and peers like went off and started doing these things, but he was doing adult things. 
And before he knew it, it was like all that time for experimentation had passed. Mm -hmm. And he found Mm -hmm. himself like in his thirties being like, this is a thing that I'm supposed to know how to do. I'm supposed to know what I want. And it's like embarrassing that I don't, Mm -hmm. or like embarrassing that I don't really know what I want or how I want it. Um, And, you know, I'll tell you what I had them do in that book. And maybe this person can. I'm like, what book is this? Cause I would like, yeah. Oh, it's (laughs) we're all like. (laughs) Wait, it's where was my copy? Yeah. Um, it's probably in the. Oh, there's a cat behind me on the phone. <laughs> yeah, I love the floof. I've been watching yeah. her walk around with her big fluffy tail. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's lovely. It's called Best Laid Plans, and basically, it's like the character who is more experienced turns the questioning about sex, about like what the other character wants, into a not a game, but like a conversation where it's very removed from sex and it's just a checkoff list. But of course, in the process of talking about it, they get very turned on thinking about like all the things that they could do to each other. And it's a way of like letting this person who's never really had sex give a hard yes or no, or a maybe I'm interested to like every possible thing. And then they have a clear place to start because it's not like, we'll just jump right into like penetrative sex and see how you like it. It's like, no, I mean, do you think it's sexy to make out? Do you think it's sexy to make out and have me touch your chest? So it's like incremental things that like at each phase give the person who's more experienced a sense of what his partner is interested in. And so mm-hmm. I feel like, you know, there, there is a reason we started this as a like romance writer advice show is I think that there are like so many ways to work through issues of with relationships and sex that we've had a lot of experience writing in so many different versions and and so I'm amused that I read this letter and I didn't even think about the fact that I had just like written this you're paper. just on it yeah well and that that well, also lays the groundwork for like some really clear boundaries and consent and like you know comfort levels for everybody involved and that's mm-hmm. there's so much media that's like you should just know or you should just do this and this is the the destination that you're working towards like as a default and it's like but it's not like that for everybody and yeah. being able to talk that with a trusted person that like you care about in a safe space is so valuable and it's more rare than it should be yeah, I totally yeah. Agree. and I feel like it's one of those things where I it should be like a regular thing too you know it, it, it isn't something that you negotiate once especially if you uh get together and you're like in your 20s then it's 15 years later and like people's tastes have changed desires have changed so I feel like it's an awesome practice no matter where, like, even if you're not dating someone who's a virgin, who you don't know what they want, that's like a great state of the union, state of the state union. of the union, state yeah. of the re- state of the union. Yeah. yeah. Did we um, have an well, episode where we, we had, um, we, I think Rowan, you may have given the advice of them having like an anniversary tradition. Yes. Where they had the checklist. Yeah. Yeah. Be- yeah. I, I think you I'm like, such, like, I'm such a nerd about this stuff, but I really feel like so strongly about the fact that emotions and relationships require this kind of like check-in and upkeep just like any just like you do with your doctor or your lawyer or your you know you have to do grocery shopping because it's like the ingredients actually run out unfortunately you don't just get to do it once and it's like magic and I think that that's true of that's sex and I, I yeah. know it's supposed to be like I know we think of sex in a different category because it's supposed like there's this uh, narrative this fairy tale narrative that it's like spontaneous and both people are always in the mood for the same thing at the same time and like sure that sometimes happens but I think much more often you know you kind of have to decide like it's a menu like making dinner or going on vacation or any other thing that like it depends on your mood and what your physical capability is and your energy level and all these things and so I feel like it is this major check-in that should be had often it's mm-hmm. like what where are you where what's your sex deal right now you know what's like, your sex deal? I think that's what the checklist should be called and I think you need to make it up on Sazzle so, what's your sex deal right now yeah. <laughs> and then there could just be checklist items yeah, like, I would be into that yeah kiss I think me when, fondle me <laughs> fondle <laughs> me fist me there you go fist me <laughs> we could just go through the f's you know <laughs> you're kidding but I will so 100% do this because if you don't understand my love may I even say lust for lists we yeah but here's think, here's our shocked face the other side of this is there's also this relux, reluctance when you're when you meet someone and you click on all these different things except for the one thing 
to try to hold on, even though you know it's a deal breaker for you, which is what she's doing. You know, mm-hmm. she, she probably knows what's going on here, but she's looking for any kind of way that she can fix that one thing because in all other ways, he's great for her. Um, so I think, you know, permission to walk away from something that's not working for you, just, you know, because it, even people who are in relationships um, sometimes feel like they're failing when the relationship ends, especially like in yeah. marriages, like they feel like they've failed something. So I think giving, giving yourself permission to walk away from a situation that you know is going to cause heartache in the future is something that we need when, to do. Yeah, yeah no, and said, I uh, think... Go oh, ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, go ahead. Uh, just yeah. like you said, like the deal breaker, like the deal breakers for each person are different, but mm-hmm. if like, and it may be, I mean, it sounds like this is a deal breaker for her, but if it's not like, they need to figure that out. Mm-hmm. And, like, yeah. Because yeah. it's like trying to cram like, oh, well, he's perfect in this way, except for this thing that's going to make me miserable our entire relationship. Right, right. Like, and it's not anything against him. It's just, you're not compatible there. Yeah. And like, there's nothing yeah. wrong, but like, it feels like it has to be like a blame thing. Like, well, we had to have a reason we broke up because he was like awful or whatever, yeah. or, you know, I did this thing and it's like, no, it's just, you just don't match up that well. It's okay. Yeah. 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 Well, and I think, I think you hit it. So, you know, when you're talking about the fact that, you know, what this is right here, this is a, I wouldn't say a red flag I in a relationship. I would say a definite yellow flag though, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that it's something that you've got to step back, really look at, figure out, is this a deal breaker for me? Is this not? And it doesn't have to be sex. It does. It, it can be a million and a half things. You know, if mm-hmm. you're like, you know what? He's perfect in every way, but he's an asshole to waiters and waitresses. You know? Yeah. Oh. Katie's face, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm yeah. like, that's an indicator of like that's a red flag <laughs> that and so that right there though again is something you've got to sit back and say okay well am I also that asshole or am I a different kind of asshole because everybody's an asshole in their own way you know so that's really what you have to look at is you know it doesn't have to be sex and honest to god I think there's more going on here um with as far as from his end of things because yeah he is reluctant and he is reluctant to verbalize the reluctance. Yeah. So I think that also tells you something. So even if, you know, even if this guy is just completely vanilla, straight up hetero as possibly could be completely, you know, exactly what you would expect a, a red blooded American dude to be like, right. But he can't verbalize any of that stuff. That also tells you, okay, when other things make him uncomfortable for whatever reason, not going to be able to verbalize that either. So is this something we can work through and we can grow from? Or am I going to be spending the rest of my life trying to get somebody to, I mean, this is a joke, but close the shower curtain and it's, he's never going to close it, you know? So it it could also be that she did something that made him feel like, or that she acted or spoke in maybe not even intentionally in a way that made him feel like he doesn't feel safe bringing up yeah. like this or or whatever um because yeah. that's it is a two-way street and it, it might be that like he maybe made a comment or so like tried to feel her out and then like you know felt like she shut him down like there's mm-hmm. when you have it only from one side it's kind of hard yeah to yeah yeah that. yeah that's that's true. True. And all right so i'm dying to know what the advice was sorry ron i just Wait, want to read but I, i'm killing <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, I, was gonna say, I think that's such a good point that like we actually don't know yet whether this is a sex problem or a communication problem right right one of I mean they're both big in different ways but I actually feel like the communication problem would be a bigger deal breaker potentially because it's about everything so yeah yeah, yeah, that's the conversation. Mm. yeah the the original response um and I don't usually read the comments or responses on these things that we do because you know yeah. I don't want to like color my whatever, but um, the first line grabbed my attention where it said, I don't have a a condom, quote unquote, is the dog ate my homework of lifetime, of the lifetime version. (laughs) (laughs) And I thought, yeah, that's a great line. And I thought, what a horrible thing to say. (laughs) Like, that's just a horrible thing to say. But like- um, Especially the dog really does eat your homework. (laughs) Sometimes, yeah. Um, But like the the letter responder uses words like um, sexual hang up, and things like that. And I'm like, wow, 2013 was really unenlightened. <laughs> like, and, and like references the, the film, the 40 year old virgin. And I'm like, mm. but the thing that she didn't say was, 
you know, learn, figure out if this is a thing you can live with. If this is a person you're really deeply in love with, and this is the one area where you guys don't click, can you live with that? Rather than saying, well, dump him kind of thing. If it doesn't work out, yeah. if, if you can't get the sex on, on the same sex page, dump, dump him kind of thing. And I was like, wow, this is so not what anyone would say. Well, hopefully anyone would say right now. Well, I think it comes down to, I mean, you can be, sexual incompatibility is a huge, can be a huge problem within a relationship. Absolutely. But it's also in how you approach that sexual um, incompatibility. And we've talked about this a lot. You know, it could be open relationship. It could be one-sided. It can be, you know what? It's Tuesday at 7 p.m. And that's my masturbation time. So I love you. Bye. You know, there's a million different ways to handle that. It's it's what you want to bring to that. But if, yeah, if your way of wanting to do that is, hey, I only want to do P and the V um, every Tuesday (laughs) at 8.30 p.m. And if that can't happen, then yeah so yeah but don't you feel more enlightened now than 2013 (laughs) yeah yeah because like we were a ton more informed yeah yeah you know yeah so well it's so much more like even in just because my elder children are teenagers and like the conversations they're having and like the verbiage and the terminology that they have is stuff that I'm like I don't even I barely knew what bisexual was like when I was in high school like, and they're like, oh yeah, my friend's asexual and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, they're, they're able to like speak these truths and like test out and figure out where they are. And it's just like, it's just fine. Like, and it, which is so amazing that like, we've come so far in like a relatively short amount of time. Like yeah. it's, yeah. so I, say, I hope that adults will get there too. <laughs> is it the knowledge doubles every 20 years or something like that? Is that, is that the, oh. the statistic? I, so, I have not heard that. Yeah, I, heard I will. Either, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think for some of us it does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> some of us it's the opposite. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but no, it's really interesting because, like, I went to college in the early '90s, so that was just a completely different time. If you want to talk about what is what was socially, sexually acceptable and what was not so even like 20 years ago if you think of like some of the comedies that came out some of the Mm -hmm. you know songs that were on the radio like the way that people it was just can you imagine like Lil Nas X coming out (laughs) with Montero or any of his stuff like 20 years ago or 10 years ago even but and even like the conversations as like quote unquote simple as like consent like didn't exist back then yeah. like yeah it was yeah. like yeah. like like you look at like um the 16 candles and it's like oh, oh all the john hughes movie like that, those discussions come yeah up, everything like, i was like everything. no that was straight up rape okay like yeah so and and like in the early or like in the 90s the like the teen movies and stuff like they were chock full of stuff that you're like whoa that did not yeah. age well yeah. like yeah and we were all totally good with that um heather's one of one of the best sorry i will stick with that the the go into the frat party scene you know where she, it's it's been a while but i remember watching it with my daughter a while back and being like holy shit which is pretty much everything you watch from the well, 80s the now. breakfast club but yeah the scene where he's under the table yep. yeah under the table and, like even then i was like uh, like uncomfortable yeah. laugh and now I'm like oh my god I can't believe they did that on screen and that was supposed to be like endearing or something yeah they totally end up <laughs> yeah. there it's fine it, yeah. they're destined so they're forever <laughs> yes all right oh um all right uh I'm going to move us along mm-hmm. uh to something that is not quite forever but is interesting well I don't know the internet's forever so uh <laughs> all right so we have our what would you do segment and we pulled this from uh, a reddit query and um so we're excited to take a look at this one here's it goes it says um my girlfriend 29 female told me 35 year old male that she was an adult film star before we met my girlfriend and i have been together for two years nearly two weeks ago on our second anniversary i proposed to her and she said yes it was a great night with great dinner lots of great sex The next morning, she was acting strange and said she needed to tell me something. 
If you read the title, then you can guess what she told me. Before she met me, she made some adult movies. She said she wanted to tell me many times over the past two years out of honesty and transparency. She was worried because she had told guys in the past and they didn't want anything serious from her and or just broke up with her. She said she was worried that I would only want her for sex and nothing else. And she says that she never felt this way about a man before. She said she made the films to earn money to start her own online business. And when it took off, she quit the industry. Another reason she wanted to tell me is that she was worried a friend or relative or even stranger might recognize her. I get that, but nothing has ever happened. So part of me is wondering why she told me now. The only question I asked is if she is still in touch with anyone from those days. She said she has Facebook friends with a few other women, but no guys and no one she ever made a film with. I'm honestly too scared to ask more questions. Don't waste your time by calling me insecure or anything like that. It's not helpful. And if all you can do is be condescending, just keep it to yourself. I don't want to break up over this. We have so much fun together in every aspect of our lives. We have plenty of things in common that we enjoy doing together. And we have the same sense of humor. And yes, the sex is amazing, but I can't seem to get the image out of my head. I don't know if talking about it with her will make it better or worse. Will it, um, will it confirm what I'm already thinking or put new ideas in my head? She can tell that this is weighing on me and she seems very apprehensive and anxious about what I will decide to do. Like I said, we have a great relationship and I don't want to break up, but how do I move past this? So I stop thinking about it. I can answer the first question. She told you because you asked her to marry him, <laughs> marry right. you and she doesn't want to keep that big of a secret from you. As, as, and yeah. it's also a confirmation <laughs> that you don't just want her for sex, that you want to spend the rest of your life with her, which is yes. like makes her feel safe enough to tell you, which is mm -hmm. a good thing. Yeah. 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 Talk I, to I, her. I, like, I don't... <laughs> like, it's, on, always, it's always the shock of somebody finding out like that their partner had people before them. Yeah. You know, I don't understand why that's always such a block for some folks, whether it's, you know, this could easily be somebody saying, you know what, uh, my, my girlfriend, my boyfriend, my whomever had an OnlyFans, you know, it could be, they just did amateur porn that they uploaded on you porn. It could be, you know, um, sugar daddy pictures or, or whatever it may be. Um, you know, there's a million things, or it could just be, you know what? Um, she told me her roster and she had like a hundred names on there. You know, it, it could be whatever may, may be that thing that, that pushes you over, but I hate to put it, but the vast majority of are not of us are not the first people with our other person. Number one. And that's a benefit, honestly, because yes. like it, it allows you to experiment and figure out what you like and don't like, and that you take that knowledge into any new relationship you're in and it makes it easier for the person you're with because you're like, no, I can say that I do not like that I do like this I will enjoy this we can have a good time doing this like how mm -hmm. is that a bad thing yeah I had such a clear and like one sentence response to this letter which was like this is a you problem bro like <laughs> yeah it really the is yeah he's in the letter he loves her they have a great time together he's not jealous exactly and then he's like I just can't stop thinking about it and I'm like cool you know what I do when I can't stop thinking about it I deal with my shit, go to therapy, <laughs> yep. write out a list of like, what are the things that the, that thinking about it entails? Like, this is not a problem with your fiance. This is not a problem about your relationship. This is a problem about you being socialized as someone who doesn't know how to deal with when you can't stop thinking about something, which is, I feel like that's code for like, I'm having a feeling, what do I do? Go, go to therapy, talk to someone, journal it out, like take a warm bath. I don't know. I, I just journal have like no out. sympathy for this when that like, I, this is how I feel when people are, when people ask, like send you an email to ask you a question that they just could have Googled. I'm like, <laughs> sure, we can go through the whole thing, I guess. But like, wouldn't it have just saved us all a lot of time and just like, if you just dealt with your own problem without involving me? I send to people Ron, with love it when you get snotty. You. Right? Snotty Ron is my favorite Ron. <laughs> let me Google that for you.com, which isn't a real site, exactly. by the way. But you know what? I think it's just, it shows what a fucked up relationship that we as Americans have with sex. I'm assuming this is American. This just sounds like gotta American. be. It has yeah. to be. Yeah. Must be. Um, with sex work in particular, because it's like, yeah. 
it's yeah. like it doesn't matter if she had made one film he would still be flipping out like this if that was the mm-hmm. only person she had been with before him and she had made one single film like he would still be having the same emotional like hyper focused reaction because sex work is so stigmatized it, mm-hmm. it like amplifies the feeling of like well they were with somebody before me like it makes it so much more so I totally like, that guy it. definitely went and watched some of those films a hundred percent like oh yeah like I can't stop thinking about it I guess I'm just gonna have to watch it and like punch myself in the chest a few times like oh. yeah. <laughs> and it's so or or he watched it and he enjoyed watching it and that freaked him out even more oh, oh yeah. god yeah <laughs> I I would believe that it's also like people who do sex work like it's not about sex it's about money. work yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, so I think that there there's something so I I totally agree with what everyone has said about like it's good that we're not all virgins when we meet our people because we know what we want but I'm also like this your your fiance wasn't having sex with people because she wanted to have sex with them she was having sex with them for money as a totally viable mode of work so if like think about what your problem is and if your problem is about the sex part I would say that like transactional sex is like as related to loving relationship sex as rape is to loving relationship sex like Mm -hmm. neither of them are about except sorry that's actually a bad example because of course if you're choosing to work then you're consenting to doing that so that's not a good example but um like they're just both not about sex within a relationship Mm -hmm. right it's not the same thing at all so yeah well I love that he opens with don't call me insecure because buddy that's what you are (laughs) (laughs) well you know and I can understand being weirded out by it uh, yeah quite honestly that's That's gonna be one of those from someone for two years years, yeah that's a big it's also I mean I think Katie you said this and I think this was such a nail on the head this is an ultimate compliment she trusted you enough after all after seeing so much you know blowback in past relationships where Mm -hmm. she was honest Mm -hmm. she trusted you enough to do this and to share this part of herself with you and she's anxious as hell of course she is because you're acting like a weirdo I also Um, really dislike the she's very anxious while she decides what or why I decide what I'm going to do like I feel like that power element is not super great like yeah mm -hmm. yeah I mean like like she submitted her case to be tried Yeah, I mean, he says, I don't want to break up. You know, this, uh, he wants to move forward with the, with the marriage, I'm assuming. But that marriage is going to fail spectacularly unless he deals with this. Unless yeah. he yes. goes to therapy, unless they talk it out. Like if he wants, you know, he said he's afraid to talk to her. Either talk to her or talk to someone else. Like festering and, and imagining. And that'll just come up every time they have a nasty every, fight. Every fight they have. It'll be like argue, throwing in her face. Everything, like, mm. everything. Everything. Mm-hmm. God, I'm just like really, um, I'm so mad at people who won't go to therapy this week. I feel like every week <laughs> I have a thing. And this week, my thing is people who like obviously need to go to therapy and won't go to therapy. And I'm like, cool. So basically- You realize therapy- that's all of us. <laughs> Well, some of it's us all actually, of us. We all need to go to therapy. No, everyone. Yeah. But I right like now, everyone really do. does need yeah. to go to therapy. Therapists need to go to therapy. <laughs> whenever people refuse to go to therapy, I'm just always like, cool. So you're making everything harder for the rest of us. Thanks. Like that's your decision to not go to ther- therapy means that you are choosing to make the, the lives of every single person you interact with for the rest of your life harder. Thanks. Thanks, bud. <laughs> but also you're making it harder for yourself like you want to be with yeah. this person you obviously care deeply enough for her to propose and want to spend the rest of your life with her why would you not t- take all the tools possible to work through this hang-up you have mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so that you can move forward like with this person you could deeply care about and not sabotage your relationship yeah reddit like, is not a therapist no yeah no and a lot of people treat it as if it is like i'm gonna go crowdsource this solution and see yeah. if you know, see if somebody can when that's a good well, way I to think just, like blow it out of proportion too and mm-hmm. like because you're either searching for something to vindicate like what you feel or you mm-hmm. get all these voices in your head and then you're like oh I definitely should break up with her because of like and that's not what you wanted because that's, that's what wanted. what Bob 63245 said I should do so, <laughs> right <laughs> yeah but I do love though that our two letters this week are exactly the same (laughs) (laughs) they really are they are looking at that issue of two uh, sides of the same coin two sides of the same coin uh when it comes to sex either they're not gonna have they don't seem to want it with me or 
um, or want it at all, or this person has had so much without me. And that makes me uncomfortable. I think we have huge hangups when it comes to sex um, as a culture, as a community. Um, and mm-hmm. pff, God, maybe that'll be what happens with the next 20 years. You know, that'll be the knowledge <laughs> that they'll get in the next 20 years. So our grandkids will be like, dude, sex, we got that figured out. <laughs> um, yeah, I hope so. That would be I hope lovely. so too. It's such a huge, it's been such a stigma stigmatized thing for centuries you know yeah because it wasn't like that and then it was and it is in this long period of time yeah (laughs) yeah well and with this with this dude with mr 35 year old right if he if this is a deal breaker for him he needs to be he needs to treat her with the same respect that and and appreciation that she misplaced with him uh, by, by being upfront about it yeah, and saying, say, he needs to be I, am, I am sorry, I cannot get yeah. over this. Absolutely. I, I, you know, and it may be something to where, you know what, maybe he needs to look at himself and say, is this going to be something that, that I'm going to obsess over and I'm going to mm-hmm. stew over for three months. And I know me, I'll realize after three months, what a dumbass I am, or is this going to be something where like you said, it's going to be brought up in every fight they have. It's going to be this, it's going to be that. Um, and if it's a deal breaker, then he just needs to be honest and say, Hey, that's, that's a deal breaker for me. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that he, I mean, maybe he's self-aware enough to make that call, but I don't, from that, I don't know that he is self-aware enough to be like, yes, this is definitely a deal breaker. More like he's like, I'll just obsessively think about this i don't see what could possibly go wrong i mean he's asking how to deal with it yeah which is admirable i'm glad that he recognizes that he needs to deal with it you know because some people will just be like well i'm just i'm gonna i'm it's fine it's fine and they fester and stew he's just asking the wrong place (laughs) there's nothing in here about i'm gonna talk to someone as a professional about it i'm here talking to the internet well, and, and it know. seems like he's also asking the wrong question. Mm. At least what I get from this letter is he's asking, how do I deal with it as the it as like this, this cloud that's now hanging over my relationship, as opposed to how do I deal with my reaction to it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and th- those are two very different things. Mm. They are. And again, why therapy is so, so useful is that like in whatever form he wants to try to address it is that like he needs to learn that he is actually the one who's in charge of what he decides to think about things and not Reddit and not external circumstances. And that just because he had one initial reaction doesn't mean that like that has to be his reaction forever. And it, it sounds to me like he's coming from this place where he feels really, really out of control. Like he feels out of control because he, a secret was kept from him. And then he feels out of control because of the content of the secret. And now he's like making himself feel further out of control by being like, I keep thinking about this thing, which he's framing as a negative, when mm-hmm. it is neutral, like thinking about something is not necessarily bad. And then he's like, how do I stop thinking about it? Or how do I deal with it? How do I, whatever. And it's like, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and like, the thing is, is he has to deal with it himself, but also like his, him not talking to her about it is not necessarily a good thing because like I mean, if he can't talk to her without it being a healthy, non-harmful conversation, that's one mm-hmm. thing. And mm-hmm. that's fair to be like, my emotions are too tumultuous. I can't talk about this with you right now. But like, never talking about, like, they, they're going to have to have another, at least another yeah. conversation or two, like, yeah. <laughs> down the road. I mean, he's saying it's two yeah. weeks ago, so it's still re- relatively yeah. fresh. Yeah. Um, but hopefully, yeah, he can say, okay, once the initial shock and my initial reaction, like Rowan said, has subsided let's have a conversation. Tell me how you got started. Tell me a typical day on the set or whatever it is that will get him out of the mindset of this was a, a, a like a passionate thing yeah. as opposed to this was a clinical, you know, they put my leg yeah. where it needed to go kind of thing, which happens on a film set. Right. Yeah. There were 10 people in the room and they were in very yeah. uncomfortable angles. Like, yeah, you know. yeah. And it's, you know, hot and sweaty and not. Well, and way. does it make it any better? <laughs> for him if she's like I hated it it was horrible the whole time or 
Right. You know, if, if she did this and she's like, yeah, it was a temporary job. I knew that I enjoyed it. You should enjoy work. Yeah. Um, you know, she's like, yeah, I enjoyed it, but yeah, it was just a temporary for me. It, you know what? I, I worked at Dairy Queen and can make a hell of a Sunday that I enjoyed it while I was there. It doesn't mean that it doesn't right, make yeah. it any no, better yeah. or worse than anything else. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Hopefully she'll be honest about it and not like cater to whatever she thinks his feelings right. are. Well, but yeah. Good like Rowan always says, talking is a good way to start to yeah, her and sure. to someone who knows what they were talking about. <laughs> well, Katie, thank you so much for being with us today to uh, talk about not having sex and then your partner having sex and then being stuck up about it. So <laughs> we really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. This is fun. Where can right, we find so you? Please, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I am, like I said, Instagram, Twitter, it's Katie with two E's underscore Robert, no S. And on TikTok is author Katie Roberts, spelled that same way. And that's where I am most of the time. What's coming out, what's coming out next for you? Is it, um, I don't want to say uh, It is The Bastard's Betrayal, which is yes. the first book in my second generation mob series that's like, it's like a follow-up to the O'Malley series and it's their adult children. And it's got the heroine shoots the hero twice in the first chapter and then he he responds by being like i love you so much i'm gonna kidnap you until you agree to marry me and you know it's, just, it's, it's you know it's a lot of fun so I they may need to have a discussion <laughs> they definitely they definitely are like they are okay at communicating though like she's like you kidnapped me and he's like that's practically a love language in your family which is <laughs> so fair enough fair it's enough. a it's a romp it's a good time oh, i <laughs> awesome. love it Thank you so much. We Thank really you. appreciate you being here. Yeah. Okay. So for this week's recipe, um, I, so I spent the last week in Michigan with my family and it was my sister's birthday. And so she requested for like, for me to make dinner, a, 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 a fancy <laughs> dinner thing. And it was summer and we were around a bunch of farm stands and stuff. So what I ended up making as a side dish, uh, is this salad that I'm now obsessed with. It's a watermelon salad. So you get a huge, nice, like ripe watermelon, chunk it up, and then you crumble in some like dried, kind of dry-ish cheese. So I used a farmer's cheese because we were near a bunch of farm stands, but you could Mm -hmm. use feta, you could use any sort of like Baltic style, like a pressed cheese, so it's not super watery. So you crumble in a ton of feta or farmer's cheese, and then you add, fresh herbs, basil, mint, parsley. What else did I do? I think that's it. Basil, mint, and parsley. A lot of basil though. Um, And mix it all together. And it's amazing. It's so good. It has the like savoriness of the parsley and the salt from the cheese. And then the sweetness of the watermelon and the basil and like this bright freshness of the mint it's so simple like cutting up the watermelon was the thing that took the longest so right. you can even pre-cut watermelon it takes five minutes and I ate like an entire watermelon worth <laughs> of it. it's so sounds good. delicious yeah, watermelon is interesting like I saw a recipe or not a recipe but like a thing where someone did watermelon steaks on the grill where they oh, brushed yeah. it with like balsamic vinaigrette and olive oil and then grilled it it's an interesting so good. I love mm. watermelon and I feel like it is because it's such an we think of it as like a, just eat it plain in the summer. Cause it's, you can yeah. it yeah. it's so whatever. Um, I feel like it's not used in as many different ways as a lot of the other fruits that we have, mm. but it's like, it's so good and tender and has such an interesting kind of spongy texture. That's unlike most other foods. Yeah. I, I mean, watermelon has a particular history in the United States Yeah, that yeah. gives it, you know, that some people just stay away from it for, for different reasons, but it's delicious. I love it. Right. <laughs> I'm gonna well, try I'm that sad. out. Yeah. We had uh, I actually got a watermelon in my um in my garden this year. I had one and it's so cute. And I was like waiting, I'm like looking it up. I'm like, when do I know to pick it? And it's like when the little curly cute rind thing turns brown, then you know it's done. So I've been like, I was out there like every other day, and then we had a huge storm, and I went out. And I don't know if it got blown, if something got knocked into it, it cracked and then it was filled with ants. 
it probably they had a nice meal. Too much water. That's what happens to tomatoes. Like if you get a big. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah. Too much water. It, oh. Yeah. That so, is so tragic. I'm and, really sorry. It it is tragic. Thank you for being horrified at oh, my. Right. I was so proud and so excited Aww. of the watermelon. No yeah. dice. Um, I did want to report back to the class though in the recipe section. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my garden with my cucumbers. Oh yes yes yes. Did you make all the pickles in the world? I have not made pickles yet. I need to, um, but I, I keep never being off deadline. Um, so cucumber slices, uh, goat cheese, a little bit of some of the dried basil from the garden. Like I dried my own, like I just hung it. So it's super fresh, mm-hmm. dried basil, and then half a cherry tomato squashed on top. Perfect. It was so good, y'all. It was so, so good. There. So I um, highly suggest it. Yeah. Um, Kimberly Kincaid and Tracy uh, Livesay also live in my area. And we had like an outdoor girls evening of wine and food and we devoured that. So mm-hmm. it wasn't just me. I have multiple. You didn't mortally wound yourself in the process of creating this dish. It's- <laughs> I <Right>. know. <laughs> I didn't harm right. myself. There were no burns. No fingers were harmed fingers. in the making of this food. <laughs> I didn't have to use a mandolin because they were thick chunks of slices. So yeah, it was all good. Nice. So there you go. So nice. there's, I, I will add to the, uh, to the cucumber recipe card. There you go. Nice. Well, and turning to music for this week, um, <laughs> I, I, I was a little tongue in cheek with this playlist, but um, the first song on it is from Janet Jackson. It's a throwback. Let's wait a while. And that was a, a oh nod to our, our 30 year old version. Um, Don't Stand So Close to Me from The Police is on there. Um, Not Your Girl from Tierra, Sin City. Girls on Film is a nod to our Ooh, second. Yeah. Uh, what Would You Do? Um, so yes, yeah, so it's got like Little Dragon. I've got Moses Sumney on here, Olivia Rodrigo, Metric, Foster the People. It's a really fun <laughs> playlist. Eclectic. Bits. Eclectic and fun playlist. So yeah, okay. so you guys let me know what you think. Gracias. Well, for uh, recommendations uh, this week, I had um, I had a TV show that that Mr. Flynn and I liked it, uh, but it's not my recommendation. But I'm gonna tell you about it anyway. It's called <laughs> Dead Water Fell, and it is on Amazon Prime, and it's got David Tennant in it, okay. and he's got his usual, he's got his actual Scottish accent. At least I'm assuming it's his his real one. And um, I don't know about the different dialects in the Scottish accent. I'm sorry. Um, but it is four episodes and it is a, what I would call a domestic thriller. Mm. So, uh, but, there, but there are a lot of things in there though, that I was screaming at my TV about. So I, I don't give it a firm recommendation, but I found it entertaining and I can't help but love David Tennant because he's my favorite Doctor Who. <laughs> um, and I just love him, period. So there you go. Uh, so my know, recommend- who do you think the next Doctor is going to be? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Ooh, I have no opinion on that. I haven't watched <laughs> it in um, in a couple of seasons. So mm-hmm. yeah, or a couple of Doctors, I should say. I have not watched the past two Doctors. Um, my recommendation for this week, though, is another podcast, which I remembered as we were doing this. It is, um, it was recommended to me. It is called Wine and Crime. Oh, yeah. And it is so much fun, you guys. It's not even, it's not even funny how fun it is. There you go. It's funny how fun it is. It is called Wine and Crime. It is these three friends who obviously have known each other since the dawn of time. Um, They've got these really thick Minnesota accents, so it's really fun to listen to that. (laughs) But they break it up. Uh, They have like a wine that they drink or something else, alcoholic, that they drink throughout the episode. Um, Hence wine and crime. And then they pick a theme. So it's not like a true true crime podcast where they follow a case like all the way through each Mm -hmm. episode has a theme so for example one of the past um episodes which is a theme i never would have thought about it was choir crime choir c-h-o-i-r and so like the first segment they like basically give you like the history of something so in this case sort of like the history of choirs and what they do and different kinds of choirs and all that stuff and then i need to know what was the homophone for choir that made you spell it because i can't figure out what it what would be 
I don't know. I think it's just from, I'm from Nebraska and I have a funny accent. And sometimes people are like, what? <laughs> but now I'm going to say choir, maybe like crier. I don't know. Crier <laughs> well, time. I, people who okay, cry and cry. I was just like, what am I missing? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe in my family, we always spell the word choir. All right. Stop judging me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then the, the second two, um, two segments are each one of the other two friends uh, talk about a specific crime that fits under that theme. And it's really fun. Uh, they drop, I want to say, once a week. Um, it's it's very interesting. It's not super gory. Um, but yeah, you can definitely, I think that the most fun part about it is you can definitely tell that these hosts have known each other mm-hmm. forever. And um, they give each other shit. And so it's just quite amusing. And I enjoy it. So there you go. So that's my recommendation. Wine and crime. I want to tune in just so I can learn about choir crime. As many choirs as I've been in, I'm like, I I mean, it gets pretty cutthroat with solos when solos are handed out. But I I will tell you that episode was, it it had child sexual abuse in there. So warning on that specific episode, um, you know, just so you know, and made me want to punch things and people. So yes, but it's still very good. Uh, this week's episode I just started and it's called Bad Bones and it's about bones and crime. And I have not gotten to the criminal aspect of it. I was just learning about bones. So there you go. Okay. Cool. Or do you, you want to? Huh? Do you want to? I can, I can go next if you want. I'll have to press you guys. No. Um, so <laughs> so I don't oh, I don't like to wreck books that aren't out yet usually because you know it's unfair but um I can't I'm I have such a book hangover from this um it's the third book in C.R. Simone's Priest series technically the fourth book because she had like a novella after the first one um and every time I read like Priest I think I told you guys a story when I met Sierra we had like a long conversation and she was under her real name we were talking about Tumblr of all things. And then we were like, oh my God, I should follow you. You should follow me. And we started to exchange information. And then like, she's like, yeah, but I don't write under this name. I write under Sierra Simone. And I, I just like dropped everything that was in my hand. I was like, oh my God, you wrote Priest. So like, I've wrecked, I think I'm responsible for like a hundred thousand copies of Priest being sold. So it's, it's a fantastic book. Um, it was one of those books I picked up. I think it was like 99 cents at the time. And it was like, this is, I hate this premise. Like, how could somebody write this premise? It's ridiculous. And then I got sucked into the story and like read it six times and was like, how did she make me love this? Um, and book two, it's about um, a priest named Tyler Bell. And then book two is his brother, Sean, um, who falls for a soon to be nun. And book three is the one that's coming out, I think September 7th. Yeah. And I love the Bell brothers. They're all tortured heroes. I love my tortured heroes. I love my broken heroes. Um, but Aiden, this book seriously broke me. I think Sierra's gift in is that she finds a way to, she writes really high heat um, and she found a way with the series to marry the sacred with the profane mm-hmm. and to examine the relationship between God and sex and, and stuff. And this book also deals with um, depression in a way that I haven't seen in a book before, especially in a romance. Um, and I had to stop in places because it was too close to home. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I fell in love with this character. He's, he's really, 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 really flawed. All these guys deal with guilt in their own way. They all, they're all dealing with guilt in their own way and they're all dealing with issues. But Aiden is a character that's going to stick with me for a really long time. And I don't want to go too much into the plot because it's just, I don't know, I don't know what goes on in her mind. (laughs) Like I would love to just like sit down and pick her brain sometime. But um, yeah, but the book is called Saint and it comes out September 7th and I cannot recommend this series highly enough. It is nothing, there's nothing else out there like this series. This really isn't. Yeah. My favorite thing, well, not my favorite thing. There are many things to love about Sierra Simone. Um, <laughs> but one of my favorites is that she literally looks like a little cherub. Like- <laughs> It's just adorable. It, like you're like a like, sexy cherub. <laughs> Yeah, you're like, butter does not melt in your mouth. She is just like, you look at her and and then you're like, wait, you wrote, 
you wrote that yeah, you, yeah that's why you? when I met her we were talking and I'm like wait you wrote that book like you know, yeah. yeah yeah I I I love that I love that that um it's not a conflict but it's the the, dichot- the dichotomy yeah, of, that, yeah, of yeah. that super sweet innocent looking uh woman and the fabulously sometimes dark and gritty and sexy and deep books that she that she writes yeah I mean yeah they're this serious is, reading this book this is her at the t- at the pinnacle of what I think of when I think of a Sierra Simone book is this oh yeah gosh that's really high praise yeah yeah I haven't read that series yet but the new Camelot books yeah I was reading when I was in New York once I was staying I was sleeping on my cousin's couch and we gotten back from wherever we were and I was like oh I'll just be reading for a little while um (laughs) (laughs) three days later in the morning and I was literally muffling my sobs with my own hand so that I wouldn't like wake up my cousin and his family and have them all be like what is wrong with you um but I I was just like holy fuck yeah you know what's 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 even more scary for me about this book is that the audio is coming and I know who's narrating it and I that's going I'm going to listen to it but it's going to break me all over again nice oh yeah yeah I'm like really you're gonna do this to me she's like yes yeah <laughs> we'll have to have her on the show to talk about her wicked days. oh my god yes yeah, we definitely yeah. should yeah yeah um so my wreck I'm like I just realized my computer was sitting on the book uh <laughs> that I could show it to you is survive the night oh I love that cover oh, oh! oh do you have it too twin <laughs> <laughs> got to start it yet i'm okay. really looking forward to it though i will not spoil anything i promise i guess i should get it um i thought it was wonderful i i have liked all of his books and i would love to uh like i could talk forever about which ones were my favorites and why but i think that the conceit of this what i what i usually think about his books are that the conceits are usually very simple and it's the execution that really makes them. I think that he is just such a smart writer. Um, and so the conceit of this movie is that it's set- in Wait, the- hold on just a second. Did you actually say the title of the book? I'm not oh, sure if you did. Yeah. I think we got too excited. Sorry, podcast <laughs> listeners. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I forget what media are. It's called Survive the Night by Riley Steger. And it just came out like last month, maybe. It's his, I want to say his fifth or sixth book. And it, the premise is that <clears throat> it's set in, uh, at a small college in the early mid nineties. And the main character has just her, her best friend and roommate has just been murdered before the book opens and she's having a really hard time dealing with it. And so she decides that she's going to leave before the end of like before winter break and go back home. She lives with her or lived with her grandmother um, because she just is like not doing well and so it it starts off with her meeting someone at the you know I don't know if like young people remember this these things but you remember bulletin boards where like you would post I'm driving home for Thanksgiving does everyone want to split gas to Akron or whatever right um and so she like is at a bulletin board looking for a ride share and there's this guy who is like oh are you also going to Ohio and oh they agree that they're gonna drive because she is leaving before the end of the semester and it's like an off time for rides. So they get in this car together, these two strangers. And basically, although there are flashbacks and some flash forwards, the whole book takes place between the two of them during this drive from the East Coast to the Midwest. So it's not even that, I think it's like New Jersey to Ohio. So it's not even that long of a drive, but it takes up the whole book and it is taught as fuck t-a-u-t since we're <laughs> we are now a spelling podcast <laughs> so basically the thing in question is like her best friend has just been murdered the killer is still has never been caught and the the clear thing that she keeps thinking about is like the killer is still out there what if i just like got in the car with this murderer And so of course, and it's mostly from her point of view, there are a few little snippets that dab into other people's points of view, like for purely uh, plot necessary reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's like, 
she's a pretty unlikable character in some ways because she's clearly going through a lot but the a thing I thought was super interesting about her she's a big film buff I almost always hate reading books where the main characters really like famous canon films because they sound like such assholes whenever they talk about them <laughs> but I don't know how but Riley Sagar seems seems to me like he must just be an anti-asshole because he somehow manages to make this girl who's like a film major in the 90s talking about Hitchcock not seem like an utter horse's ass and that's <laughs> magic to me like, that's talent that's skill. Yeah. <clears throat> so basically she has her parents died when she was young and she's always had this like <clears throat> excuse me this like dissociation where when things are really stressful she sees things as if it's film mm. so, like some things aren't real some things are partly real <clears throat> and so she like oh excuse me wait hold on take a second yeah, take, take a, a second <laughs> take a drink we love you sorry for those of you who can't see <laughs> Ron even had like the tears in her eyes she was trying <laughs> to hold it together for y'all she really was she was really trying um <laughs> you ever just do that thing where your voice goes away mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I can hear the little, that's happened yeah. to me on stage, actually. That's like yeah. the worst. Like right in the middle of a song, it'll just like, Oh, no. Well, fortunately, the stakes here are much lower for me. <laughs> uh, anyway, she just like can't tell what's real and what's not real uh, mm -hmm. at certain high stress moments, which of course is like sort of a problem if you're trying to figure out if you're in the car with a murderer. Right. Uh, anyway, I will give away nothing. So I'm not going to say any more, but I will say this book has like a triple twist and not in an annoying well. not in an annoying like i'm gonna trick you way mm -hmm. in a way that is like very character oriented okay uh, anyway highly recommend survive the night i'm gonna order it when we finish well yay i'm super excited i got it in a um a book box so it was not one that I picked myself, but I saw it and I was like, oh, that looks really, really good. I'm super pumped about that. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to know somebody else that I can talk about the book to <laughs> then <laughs> after I'm done. Yay! Rowan. <laughs> you okay? He's like, thumbs up. Yeah, thumbs up. Oh, <laughs> yeah, don't, don't try to talk because I know when you're trying to like. Yep. No. It takes a minute. Yeah. She's so moved by the book that she's in tears. Yes, <laughs> so she's very into it. Well, uh, thank you guys. <laughs> she just held out the held up the book and mocked, uh, reacted, crying. Uh, thank you guys so much uh, for spending another hour or so with us here at Dear Romance Writer. We love having you. Please send in your anonymous letters. You can ask yes. us about sex, which we tend to talk about quite a bit. Relationships, work, writing books, anything. anything. We will really. give you questionable advice on absolutely everything. So please go to dearromancewriter.com and submit your anonymous letter and let us know. Or if you have like a topic, even mm -hmm. that could be kind of fun. Uh, yeah. Or if you found yes. something like we, you know, we like to go through other sources and find interesting things yeah. to talk about just send it to us we have some really fabulous more fabulous guests coming up people like katie and um yeah so oh. tune in write us you never know who might be answering your letter <laughs> that is very very true we've got great guests coming up i um all right should we tell them should we no no them? we don't <gasps> tell them anything you know so me i would have told you guys i'm the nice one i'm the nice <laughs> one see me i am <laughs> but send in your letters thank you so much for spending another hour with us uh we can report that uh ron is still breathing yeah. um, so and smiling <laughs> <laughs> and smiling she's still with us and not blue. so uh, yeah she just feels very powerfully about that book so yes uh thank you again have a great day and um you know try not to be an asshole so there you go bye y'all bye, bye. Thank you so much for subscribing to Dear Romance Writer. Remember to keep sending in those letters at DearRomanceWriter.com. We can't wait to tell you what to do. Dear Romance Writer is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love, frolic.media slash podcasts.